Okay, our next speaker is another example of someone cruising along in life and suddenly the UFO ET issue explodes into their world. Faced with a startling and challenging situation, she stepped up. In her capacity as a staff writer for the Stephenville Empire Tribune, she was the principal reporter covering the sightings in and around Stephenville, Texas in January of 2008. Due to the proximity to the President Bush's Crawford, Texas home, 70 miles, and the presence of F-16 fighters, these, sightings, uh, these sighting events received international attention. Subsequently, our speaker appeared on CNN's Larry King live and continues to do many interviews across the nation. The Mutual UFO Network, Texas branch, recognized her recently as the organization's lead investigative reporter. Recently, she left the Empire Tribune and joined the Mandatory FM radio station in Stevensville as news director. Mandatory FM is a growing music station featuring Texas artists and the only local station with streaming online listening audience. But now, it's also Stevensville's official UFO information station. Which it probably still is. But Angela has, uh, I'm afraid she has her sights set even higher. So she's already moved on from that, if I'm correct. And I don't know where she's going to end up, but let's just say she's like Rosie Ruiz, who uh, won the Boston Marathon about 30 years ago by jumping in in the last, I think, 3,000 yards, cruised across the finish line, got the trophy, went home, until people started thinking, I don't think she had the calf muscles to win the, the uh, marathon. They checked some films, found out what she did. They had to take the trophy back, and no one ever remembers who the real winner was. She has, uh, our, our speaker has jumped in to this issue at the very last so she can race across the finish line and get all the gold. No problem. No problem at all because she is a reporter who stepped into this issue and I have great admiration for reporters that do that. Maybe she just doesn't know enough to be frightened. But my guess is she's made a very smart move. Our speaker, who is a native of Stephenville, earned her Bachelor of Science and graduated magna cum laude from Tarleton State University in 1998 with an interdisciplinary teaching certificate. In 2007, she earned two second place awards from the West Texas Press Association for feature writing and special coverage. And she's a member of the Delta Kappa Gamma, a professional women's organization for teachers. And during her off hours, our speaker can be, can be found at home writing for StephensvilleLights.com, the official site for updates on the Texas sightings, or working in a flower bed with three dogs trailing behind her, and oh yeah, being a wife and mother along with that as well. Her husband, Randall, is with her here today. Please welcome Angela Joyner to X Conference 2008. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, what a nice welcome. I'm not used to this. I'm not used to being in the limelight, certainly not used to uh, standing up in front of a big crowd and talking. So uh, you guys are just going to have to bear with me, and I'm just going to do the best I can. Um, did get to do this once before at the Ozark Conference last week. That makes it a little easier, but not much. Um, the title of my talk today is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of UFO Reporting. It has been good, it has been bad, and it definitely got ugly. But I'm moving on, and I'm happy with the choices that I've made. Um, just in case you're not familiar, Stephenville uh, is about 70 miles southwest of Fort Worth, about 60 miles from the Crawford Ranch, and about 70 miles from the Brownwood Military Operating Area. I've grown, I grew up in Stephenville, left when I was about 18 or 19 like most young people do and said, oh, I'm never coming back. And then uh, I had a baby when I was 30 and it, about two years later I said, I can't wait to get back where I have somebody else to help me with this child. <laughs> Stephenville's known for um, cowboys. It's referred to as the cowboy capital of the world. The gentleman you see on your right is Ty Murray. He's seven-time world champion cowboy. He's retired now. There, there are other world champion cowboys living there, like um, Tuff Hedeman. Harry Tompkins lives right down the road in Dublin. Um, many world champion calf ropers, 
bareback riders, um, that sort of thing. In uh, the 90s, the high school football team uh, took the state championship four times. Um, that's what a lot of people talk about in Stephenville is high school football. Also, uh, for a long time, Erath County was the number one uh, milk producing county in Texas. Uh, that has changed a little bit. I don't think they're uh, number one any longer, but there still is a lot of milk produced there, a lot of dairies, but for environmental issues, a lot of them, a lot of the dairies are leaving. This wild ride I've been on started about a siding on January the 8th, and it's a rural community called Selden, Texas. It's about 12 miles south on Highway 281. I think I did, a, I read once that the, uh, at the peak of this little community, they had about 2,000 residents, and now they have about 22. Steve Allen called me on January the 9th, and it was an afternoon call, and like most witnesses I've talked to, he prefaced what he had to say to me, and uh, something like, okay, I really need to tell you something, but I don't want you to think I'm crazy. And uh, kind of paused to see if I was going to have an open mind maybe, and I said, sure, go ahead. And he began telling me a story that uh, I found pretty incredible. Steve is a pilot. He's pictured here with his Cessna. He keeps it at Clark Field in Stephenville. Um, after he called, um, I did call the airport. I knew some people there and said, what about the Steve Allen? He's called me with a pretty wild story about something he saw last night. He has no idea what it was. The gentleman I was speaking to was the airport manager. His name's Todd Downs, and he said, yeah, I know Steve. He called me early this morning. I've been on the phone with the FAA all, all morning trying to help him find out what it is. So uh, then I began making calls to the people that were with Steve, and I did the story. Um, this is the first story I wrote. Um, there was a lot of talk in the newsroom that evening. Of course, you know, we, all, we have to work to a deadline. And uh, a lot of talk about this headline, possible UFO sighting. Uh, some didn't want UFO in the headline. I did, and so did the publisher. Because I kept saying, but UFO only means unidentified. It really doesn't mean little green men. And the argument was, well, that's what people think about it. And uh, so we went round and round about that and uh, finally came up with the headline, Possible UFO Sighting, and the subtitle you see there. Uh, Steve Allen, I felt, was a very credible witness. He has logged many, many flight hours. He's not someone that was prone to wild stories or fancy tales. Um, one thing that I always remember him saying is, we all flipped out. He said, he told me, I didn't sleep a wink last night. It, it really bothered him, you know, what he saw. Whoops. Um, he called it an un unidentified flying object, and because he has been a pilot for 30 years, he does have quite a bit of judgment Good, good experience and judgment about uh, air speeds and distances. So I did include that in the story. He said that it had flashing lights and it was about 3,500 feet above ground level. He said the actual craft wasn't really visible, but it was totally silent. And he thought it was about a mile long and a half mile wide. It was right above Highway 67. He said it was traveling towards Stephenville at about 3,000 miles per hour. Um, he said the lights were not like any normal aircraft that he knew of. Uh, he said they were more like strobe lights. They were flashing. 
And um, as they were watching this horizontal configuration, suddenly reconfigured into two vertical sets of lights. Uh, and in just a few seconds, those lights turned into uh, two dirty flames, what he calls dirty flames, not blue flames, but white. And they were about a quarter of a mile apart. And uh, then the flames just disappeared. <clears throat> Now, he was with friends, and uh, actually Steve's place is in Glen Rose, but uh, he was at a gentleman's house named Mike Odom, and his wife, Claudette Odom, and Lance Jones uh, were also witnesses to this strange event. Um, Claudette wasn't there the first time they saw it. She came in from work, and they rushed up to her car and said, look, we've just seen something. You're not going to believe this. We don't have any idea what it was. Wish you had been here, that kind of thing. And she was going, oh, yeah, right. And they had been burning brush, and they had all you know, been working. Well, Lance Jones had already left, and um, Steve said it was because he got scared. Lance said that's not true. <laughs> so... Um, as they were talking to her, she called Lance Jones and said, what is going on there? These guys are telling me this wild story and they're just trying to pull my leg, aren't they? He said, no, they're not, and hurry up and get back out there. It's back. He could see it from Highway 67 again. So they all go back out there and, uh, and, and witness the thing again. But this time, there are two F-16s Steve thought at the time they were F-16s. He said he wasn't really sure because he couldn't get a good look at the tail section, but uh, he said it really looked like they were in pursuit. And um, the second time it came over was about 10 minutes after the first time. And uh, it came from the west traveling towards Glenrose or in an easterly direction. And uh, when I interviewed Claudette Odom, she said, it's just not explainable. It was something not natural. It was moving way too fast. Um, she had been a flight attend attendant, and she said, I know planes, and it, it just wasn't moving like a plane. So that first story, Steve Allen wanted his phone number. I said, are you sure you want your phone number in this article? He said, yeah, because I know this thing was so huge that other people had to have seen it. And if anybody got pictures or videos, I, I want those. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll include your number. Well, the first headline you see there is the second story I wrote, Mysterious Sightings Keep Locals Guessing. My phone began ringing off the wall, ringing off the wall, his was ringing off the wall. I was calling him. He would email me. It was incredible. And um, I chose four people to write about. Um, I, I called a lot of people and uh, trying to track down some. Some didn't want to go on the record, of course. Um, I was very impressed with those that, that did. Um, it was... Uh, Constable Leroy Gayton, he's the Erath County Constable for Precinct 2, and a retired veteran, James Hughes, a local business owner named Ann Frazier. She's an older woman, and she's had a business there for years called the Flying Needle. She does all kinds of arts and crafts type things, and she had been to the nursing home to see her husband and had seen it on her way home. And then an acquaintance of mine that I had known for 20 years, I guess. Um, his name is David Jaquis, and he's a custom home builder. And um, I knew him as an acquaintance through another friend. But all four of those people were willing to go on the record. And I basically just kind of wrote an intro and quoted them what they saw and kind of left it at that, um, I think that's what gave more people uh, the courage to come forward. You don't make fun of people or poke fun at pe people that, that you've 
known for years and known to be credible people in your little community. And these type places, everybody knows everybody. And um, it was more like, well, if they said they saw something, they saw something. I know this, this person is my neighbor, or I go to church with him, or you know, however their relationship was. I, I really think that that helped to uh, get more people on the record and to start rep reporting to move on. But um, by Monday, after that January 10th story, the first story on Thursday, Angela Brown called me, and she's an Associated Press writer, and she had heard about it somehow, and she said, Angela, what in the world is going on down there? I'm hearing all these crazy things. Well, the last time I had seen her and worked with her was the April before at the KKK rally, and I had never really worked anything like that, so I pretty much stuck to her like glue, and um, so I got to know her pretty well during that time. And uh, so I felt like I could really talk to her, and I said, I really think something's going on. There, there's people calling. My, I'm getting all these emails. I, I don't know what it is, but maybe you should get down here. So it was probably an hour and a half, and she was there. Um, Ricky Sorrells had contacted Steve Allen, and I had his name, but I hadn't had time to contact him. And... Uh, uh, we decided that's who Angela should interview. So she went with Ricky Sorrells out to his property and um, learned something that I really hadn't understood, and that was he had seen something before Steve Allen and his friends saw it and had actually gone to work and told everybody at work, man, you guys are not going to believe what I saw, and they didn't. And they made fun of him, and they were bringing him, you know, uh, green donuts and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they like him, so they were, you know, they were going, yeah, right. Well, and he just told me the other day, he said, you know, Angela, I forgot to tell you this. Whenever uh, that story came out, they get newspapers where he works. And he said, there was about ten of them running to me with newspapers going, what would you see? What would you see? Because look at this story. <laughs> So Angela came down on January the 14th, and her story hit that evening. And suddenly, the, uh, sorry about that, Stephenville, everything it was known for became overshadowed, became overshadowed with the whole UFO thing. Now, there were a lot of people that had fun with it, and a lot of people that were just really interested in it. But I just got the sense that the upper crust people of the town really weren't that excited about it. I heard from a good friend that the Chamber of Commerce, after about a week, had a meeting and say, okay, well, we're getting all this attention, what are we going to do? And they said, nothing, let's drop it, we don't want to be Roswell. People began to capitalize off the event. This is one of the t-shirts, and you see there's the dairy cow, <laughs> and you see the, the cows going up in the spaceship behind him. Well, this uh, t-shirt was done by a company in Stephenville called Barefoot Athletics, and I talked with the owner in nine days uh, through the internet and just local business. He did $90,000. Then um, I got word that the high school science class had designed a t-shirt also. Two of the girls had designed a t-shirt. And um, I went and did a story with them. And they did $4,000 in six days. Um, the most money that little science club ever made for a fundraiser. <laughs> And as I was speaking with her teacher, she goes, you know, Angela, I feel terrible. We really should have kept going. We were still getting orders, but I couldn't teach and they couldn't learn. We had to stop. <laughs> so a lot of people, it, it did benefit. Leroy Gayton 
went all over the news, just like Ricky Sorrells. Um, this is the constable. I talk to him now on um, at least every other day basis. He just did a uh, program for Dateline last week. It was a taped program. It should be out May the 1st. It's my understanding it's going to be the top 10 UFO sightings in the world, and they've listed Stephenville as number three. You know, somebody like Leroy Gayton has a lot to lose because he's an elected official, and I just I have a lot of respect for him because when I called um, after Steve told me about him because he didn't call me at first, um, he you know he hesitated a little bit. Then he said, no, I think it's important. He said well, that what we saw was really, really different. He said even with the binoculars, there was no outline. It started moving towards Stephenville and moving so fast, I had trouble following it with my binoculars. It covered a big area. It sounds crazy, but we really saw what we saw. Now, he was outside with his 8-year-old son. He did go and, and try to get his wife to come out, but she didn't believe him, and she was busy. So she didn't come out. Um, he has done a lot of interviews and really has kind of uh, put himself out there as far as you know what's going to happen to him when it comes time election time. I think he'll be okay because he's so so well liked. This is James Hughes. Um, he was also in the second story. He's the retired veteran. He does have some navigational experience. He lived close to downtown Stephenville, close to the courthouse. And uh, uh, Leroy Gayton lives all the way over in Dublin, which is about 12 or 13 miles down the road. And this was his comment to me and, that I wrote about. I don't know what it was that I saw while I was walking two friends to their car at my home, but as soon as I saw it, I jokingly said to them, hey, look, a UFO. I saw two red lights acting unusual. And that was also in Leroy's description. Two red glows is what Leroy called it. Now, Leroy has also um, seen something since then on February the 9th, and he has captured it on his police car dash cam. It's just that it becomes an issue of who does that video belong to? He was off duty. Um, it's, I think it will be released eventually. It's just taking some time. Tuesday after Angela Brown was there on Monday, I believe this was the 15th, the Texas news crew started rolling in, and this was really the beginning of the media frenzy. Um, I was kind of excited about being on the news. I've never been on the news. So when my little girl, she's not little, she's 17, um, was out of school, I called her and I said, hey, Reagan, I think if you watch 4, 5, or 10, I might be on the news at 5 o'clock. She said, okay, Mom, what's for dinner? <laughs> she really keeps me grounded. <laughs> About two weeks into it, Major Carl Lewis with the Naval Air Station uh, sent out a press release. I had already called him about two or three days into it to check out were there F-16s in the area. I called the base in Abilene and a couple other places. And, um, you know, it was kind of a thing of, well, no, we didn't have any, but you might call these people or whatever. Well... Major Lewis was a friendly, friendly man and just talked and talked and talked to me and um, said, you know, Miss Joyner, I don't know, but I'll, I'll check this out. Um, he said, I have an idea of what they, they, might have seen, they might have seen. And he thought it was two big airliners that um, had gotten in a position where the sun was reflecting strangely off of them and that's what the people saw, and that was just what he was speculating. So he did some research, called me back the next day, and said, no, we did not have any F-16s in the area. I said, okay, um, do you know where else can I call? And he said, well, 
just, uh, he, he mentioned Abilene again, said, no, I already called them. Uh, he was pretty sure, I mean, he seemed so, he was really believable. So uh, then I got word of this press release two weeks later. And um, I didn't receive word from Major Lewis. Now, Major Lewis had my email, and he had my cell phone number, and he had my office number. I find myself on the phone with KRLD Radio. Um, I believe the DJ's name was BJ. And she said, hey, what do you think? Uh, you're on the air. What do you think about the military backtracking on their statement? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I haven't heard about this. Let me get back to you. So I immediately went to the fax machine. I double-checked my email. Nothing. So I start calling, and I can't get him on the phone with his office number. But he had given me a cell phone number two weeks earlier. I just kept calling. I just kept hitting redial, 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 redial. And uh, he finally answered. And he was not at all the same man. His demeanor had completely changed. Before, he was just a normal guy, just talking like I'm talking to you. And uh, any question that I would ask him, he would say, Miss Joyner, I'm sorry. All I can say is, and he would start to read me this press release. I'm going, come on, Carl, how do you lose 10 F-16s for two weeks? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. you got to give me something else. And he would still say, Miss Joyner, I'm sorry, all I can say is, and he would read that press release. I tried, but I didn't get anywhere. Oh, and it's kind of as a side note, um, I, I had met, uh, after this, I had met Molly Abrams with Breakthrough Films, and she also tried calling. And um, she got in touch with someone else, and uh, he was no longer uh, the official spokesperson. So... I really feel like he must have been reprimanded. Um, let me back up a little bit before I do this next slide. People do did speculate, are still speculating, that those F-16s were scrambled because of the Crawford Air, Air Base. M maybe. But the president wasn't there that night. That airspace gets smaller when he's not there, larger when he is there. Um, who knows? I don't think they'll ever tell us. Now, the um, colonel did say that the F-16s were in the Brownwood Military Operating Area doing training exercises, and he had in that press release, uh, which includes ERAF County. Well, it doesn't. It just includes a little tiny bit of Dublin. Um, so I had pilots in my office the next day uh, spreading out their aeronautical maps and going, if we're in that operating space, it's news to us, and look at this date, this is the last map you can get. So, you know, did another story about that. Now, all this time, I still have never talked to Ricky Sorrells, but I've seen him on the news. Um, it's just that I'm so inundated with calls and emails and trying to write for the next day and meet the deadline, I just didn't get to him. The next thing I know, um, he is calling me, and he wants a meeting, and I say, sure. So he said, now, I'm going to come out there, but I don't want you to write about me. I said, okay, I won't. And um, first time I'd ever met the man, he said, I've been talking to uh, Leroy Gayton, and um, somebody's bothering me, something's going on, I'm having all these helicopters flying over my place, they are uh, running my cattle to death, uh, I'm afraid they're going to run them through the fences. Now he has a regular job, you see, but like many people in rural areas, he has livestock, and that's part of his income, and um, it's a considerable investment for him, Ricky's only 37. So... Uh, he had also uh, had some phone calls and thought, believed them to be military because they identified themselves as military. And he came to me out of concern for my safety. He said, I'm not here to, for you to write a story, Miss Joyner. 
Um, I've had about all of this press stuff I want. Um, he felt like he had been misled by the Associated Press. Um, he, it, to him, it was like, okay, I just talked to these people. They said they were going to uh, a nonprofit or nonprofit organization. They're going to put it on the internet. It's going to be a story, and the video is going to be for them to back up the story. Well, that's the way he understood it. And then the next thing you know, he's gone to Tractor Supply to get dog food, and his phone starts ringing off the wall. People are going, "But what are you doing? You're on the news about UFOs." He's going, "What?" I mean, he had no idea, and so it upset him. And uh, he was concerned for me. He said, if people are harassing me and you're, you're writing about this, then I think you might be next. And I just, I felt like I had to warn you that this was going on. He said, I talked to Leroy. He said, I can trust you that um, you'll, you won't write about me if I ask you not to. I said, no, of course. I said, but Ricky, I, I believe you that somebody is really bothering you. Um, Nobody's going to bother me because they know I'm going to write about it. And uh, he said, well, you might have a point there. I said, I think you would be better off to go on the record, go public, because that might take some heat off, you know, if they know that you're not going to be quiet about it, that you're going to keep talking about it, then, then uh, maybe they'll back off of you. He still said, no, no, you know, he's got a family, he's got two little girls, and uh, he had had a, a, uh, an unwelcome visitor, and um, that was pretty scary for him. And I always forget, he sat across the table, I mean, I always remember, he sat across the table from me, he said, if you told me a while back that I would be sitting here talking to you about UFOs, I would have said, no way, not in a million years. Now I know for the rest of my life, I'll keep looking to find out what it was, and he is. Um, he had a man come on his property about 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and the way that uh, Ricky's home is situated, he's got bird dogs in kennels on one end, and then he's got uh, labs on the other end. Well, the dogs were making a ruckus, and something was going on. So he, he, he got up to, to look around and, and see what was happening, and he saw someone. And it was between the car and the pickup, and he said, the man seemed to be rocking. He said, I know he could see me. And he said, our eyes met. And he said, he had his rifle, and he said, I was debating what to do. And he said, I was just about to, to open the door, and I thought, you know, I better not, because what if some, my family's in here. So just as he was trying to decide what to do, the man turned and walked off into the woods, and when Linda Howe came to visit with Ricky, he found this brand new bullet just dotted uh, with, and it had been a misty night, so he feels like that that man dropped this bullet. Um, of course, we'll, we'll never know that for sure, but he is a man that keeps up with his fence lines, and he knows his property inside out, and he knows pretty well that that bullet wasn't there. So then we um, wound up on Larry King. Uh, that was an experience in itself. <laughs> when the producers first came and talked to me at the newspaper, I said, okay, you know, I've already done two little things with CNN, you know, just remote through the telephone, but tell me again who you're with? Larry King Live. I was like, Oh, you got to be kidding me. So we did, uh, Steve Allen and Claudette Odom and I did this show in Selden, outside, and it was 34 degrees. You don't know how cold 34 degrees is until you're wired up and you can't get up and walk around or anything. You just have to sit there. So that was an experience, and that was uh, when I first knew about James Fox, and he was on that show with us, and he did come to Stephenville and interview me, and he was just in Stephenville again this past Wednesday, and I spent most of the day with him and Ricky Sorrells. Ricky finally agreed to that interview, and uh, James expects his new movie, Beyond the Blue, to be out sometime in July.
The very next day after Larry King Live, um, MUFON came to Dublin and we advertised this pretty well and we said, you know, anybody that saw something, please go make a sighting report. Well, I thought we'd have maybe 30, 40 people because I, I knew there were more than that that had seen it, but I didn't think more than that would show up. Well, that was a media frenzy in itself. There was, there was about as many TV cameras there as there were people. I mean, the ratio. And uh, it was pretty incredible. Steve Hudgens, the Texas lead investigator, brought 50 sighting forms and ran out like that. And uh, another investigator went to his car and got some more, and they ran across the street trying to make copies. And I think in all, they handed out about 130. Then all those TV cameras that you see there in this slide, uh, as they told witnesses to go in this little room over there, well, there wasn't room for them to all get in the little room. So they started lining out, out the door. All the TV cameras immediately turned on those people, and they just started leaving. A lot of people did not want to be on the news at all. And right then, Ken Cherry, the state director, and Steve Hudgens said, we're going to have to do this again. Look at all the people leaving. So uh, it was uh, quite an event. That lady you see there with the laptop, all the cameras gathered around her, that's Margie Galvez. She lives in Brownwood. And um, she has captured something very intriguing uh, on a wildlife camera that she has set up. It's an orb. And uh, I've just started learning about all this, so I'm still reading. And uh, it looks like the orb just surrounds the camera and uh, just envelops it, and it's spinning. And then there's a beam of light. You probably saw this. You might have seen this on the History Channel. doesn't go all the way to the ground. And about three weeks after that beam of light is there, a deer steps into where it was and just is gone. So she has some interesting film there. Um, just so you'll know, this is Ken Cherry. I talk to him fairly often. They thought that they would be able to get the MUFON report out this month. They will not be able to. He just told me that yesterday when I was on my way to the airport. They were going to do it this month with a big press conference. They just can't get it all done. Just some more of the TV cameras that were there, news media. Well, after um, the local news media and uh, people like that were there, then the international media started just filing in. This is a news crew from Brazil uh, with Steve, at Steve Allen's office with Steve and Steve Hudgens. Um, they came because they had had a siding in a sugar cane field. And it had become such a big deal in their country. They were coming here to, to uh, compare notes. We also had another news crew from Japan, but I was never able to hook up from, for them. Now, one reason Steve Hudgens is in this photo is because Steve Allen had invited him down to see film from this man, uh, David Curran. And... I left Steve's office and went immediately to see David. Um, you can barely see the little boy, but that's his, uh, that's David's grandson. The other man is just a friend and was there that night. He did the filming. His name is Eric. But the little boy is the one that alerted David to funny lightning in the sky, Papa. And uh, he really didn't know what he was talking about, went outside, saw something looking strange, went in and got his video camera. Now, some people think that that's shaky camera syndrome. It was a, a JVS 32 times optical zoom. Um, I've seen the debunking of the video, it, and you know they've done something quite similar. But I always go back to that little boy. You know, he talked to me about it too. It, something caught that little boy's eye too, and uh, I don't, I don't think it was a plane. 
um, or a star that, that caught his eye. Um, let's see. Well, after I did those stories about Ricky, I did two stories with him after he finally stopped being frightened and got mad about his cows being run to death. And um, I was asked not to do any more stories for UFOs, and um, I tried to comply with their wishes. I'm like most people, I need a paycheck. And I, but I, I, they didn't give me a way to comply. I was still the media contact. I was still the witness contact. They had already had to dump my emails on my computer two times because it just froze up. I was still getting uh, emails from Finland, from uh, the UK, from Canada, just from all over the place. And my phone was still ringing off the wall. Um, part of the reason, I think, is because when this story hit, I was the only full-time reporter. We had a half-time reporter and a sports writer and then the editor. So a story like this really drains the resources of a small paper. I was responsible for writing two, for finding and writing two front page stories a day, and then I was responsible for three full pages in Sunday paper. So I was lucky to get one story on the front page. Those weekend pages suffered. So what I wasn't doing meant other people were having to pick up my slack. And it went on a long time, and I think they just got tired. You know, they were tired, and um, they had received some criticism from some people in town that uh, thought it was time to move on. We don't want to become the next Roswell and that sort of thing. So I tried to direct all those phone calls to lunch hours or after hours. And I was, I was forwarding my email to my home email. And I was trying to look at those and go through them and answer them after 6 o'clock. Well, apparently that wasn't the right thing to do either. So um, I, I ended up giving my notice. I said, this just isn't going to work out. The editor said, just ignore the people. Don't talk to those witnesses anymore. Just forget the whole thing. Get back to the school board meeting and the city council meeting and the, you know. I just couldn't abandon those witnesses. They were thrust into the limelight just like I was, but... I mean, I had hardly any experience either, but at least I could kind of help them and guide them along. Plus, it was, it was shaking them to their very core about what they had seen. Uh, Ricky and Steve had their belief system challenged. It, um, you know, it was causing... Uh, a, I was really worried about Steve Allen. He wasn't sleeping. You could tell he was just haggard. He was going up in his plane three times a week at least, looking for it again. His wife told me he was on the Internet constantly looking for pictures, uh, trying to find something that looked like what he had seen. So um, I gave my notice, and uh, a week into my notice, I went to work about 9 o'clock, um, no computer on my desk, no Rolodex, and I got called to the big office. And it um, didn't matter what I said. Um, it was all turned around on me. Some, for some reason, they had heard that I had a job interview with the Dallas Morning News. I did not. I couldn't move to Dallas if I wanted to. I have a 17-year-old daughter with another year of high school. But um, that interview, he was wanting to do a story on the impact the sighting had had. Evidently, they thought it was a job interview. I don't know. Anyway, I was given a cardboard box and told to go pack my belongings, so I did. This is something that the Washington Post uh, wrote. Adding a further wrinkle to this story, Joyner was fired from the Empire Tribune a week ago. She claims she has been told to back off the story and thinks the town's upper crust was embarrassed by all the attention 
The Empire Tribune has avoided comment, which, of course, only fans the flames of the conspiracy theories. I don't really think there's any conspiracy. I don't think anybody uh, called them up and say, hey, tell that girl to go on to something else. I just think it was their own news judgment, and I think everybody was tired. So then we have the second meeting for uh, those witnesses that didn't want to be on camera. Um, This is Steve Hudgens, that lead investigator for uh, MUFON I was telling you about. Um, That was on February the 23rd, and I thought, I wonder if we'll even have anybody show up. Well, they collected 17 more reports that day. And one thing I noticed was some of those people had already been there. They weren't there to report again, but they were looking for other people to talk to, just to have somebody to compare notes. And did you see what I saw? And uh, somebody that they could talk to that wasn't um, going to laugh at them. So... um, I thought that was interesting that they were still seeking out um, other people as late as February the 23rd. So then you just heard that big deal. Steve um, was talking about uh, me going to work for Mandatory FM, and yes, I did. And they do tout themselves as the official UFO station. And uh, John Hollinger, you see there, is the owner He is a friend of mine, he's still a friend of mine, but they were more interested in radio ad sales than news, and my last day there was about 10 days ago. Um, Sales, just not my bag. Uh, We're still friends, and uh, you know, he's got to have somebody that can do news and, and sales, and that just really wasn't me. So, here I am, unemployed once again. While I was at the radio station, UFO hunters came to town. They had contacted me several times and uh, asked us to participate. This little group we have for our website, Steve Allen, myself, Ricky Sorrells, Leroy Gayton, um, we all talk quite a bit. Um, They kind of leave it up to me as to what we do and what we don't do, and they want me to be the spokesperson and all this stuff. Well, that's Bill Burns. He's in that uh, show, and uh, he's, he also has UFO Magazine. And we did not participate in that show, and I get lots of questions about that. It aired Wednesday night a week ago, so I thought I would just clear them up here. There were some conf- the, the David Koran video... UFO hunters came to town to purchase that video. That's fine. This man was a very poverty-stricken man. He was unemployed. He had about four grandkids living with him and his daughter and uh, uh, the radio station owner that you just saw there had to go get him the day before they, um, that day because the day before they arrived, the water pump had gone out on his van. So... That's fine, and they negotiated, and they bought that video. Later on, I heard that um, that whole deal didn't go exactly like it was supposed to, and um, I couldn't really ever get their storyline, and I had seen a couple of their shows, and not that they were bad shows or anything, but I was just afraid it was going to be too sensationalized, and I didn't... uh, I didn't want that for, for this sighting. I, th- I thought it was too important for it to be sensationalized into kind of a entertainment type show. So we didn't do that. Now, since then, I write on StephenvilleLights.com, and this is what three officers, area law uh, enforcement officers, saw on January the 8th. Now, it took them a long time to come forward. I knew about them. Only one of them is talking to me. It took a long time for me to get him to talk, and then um, he would only talk with me referring to him as, I I called him Officer X. 
and he did this computer composite of what all three officers saw that night of January the 8th about 7.30. He claims it's, he thinks it's stealthy. Uh, the top lights you see there on the towers, the little red ones, and then the bottom on the towers are white, uh, are strobing, and he said that's the only way that they could uh, see the outline of the craft is because of the flashing. But if you would like to um, go to my website, stephenvillelights.com, you can read that entire story. How am I on time? I don't think I set my watch. Ten minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, let me say this too. These three officers were not together. One was on duty. That's Officer X. Uh, one was on his way home from duty. The other one had been off all day and was out on his patio. Now, they didn't talk about it until they saw that first story, January the 10th. So I wonder what this, this is. All these people are seeing. We, you know, we know these people. These are our neighbors. And then they can well, you know, I saw something too. So they started comparing notes. He did this whole composite and brought it back, you know. They said, no, this part isn't right. This is right. And he tweaked it up to where they all agreed to what it, they saw, their, their parts of it. And I thought it was interesting that it started out horizontal and then went totally vertical and added a third light. Because if you'll remember, that's what Steve Allen said. It was horizontal, but it went into two sets of vertical lights. And that was the same night. So I thought that was fairly interesting. I just received an email from um, Officer X Tuesday a week ago. And it said, Angela, it's not gone. My daughter saw it. And he had tried to call me that night, but I had gone to bed, and I, I usually turn off my cell phone. So um, he did call Leroy Gayton. Leroy went and tried to see it again. He, he couldn't find it. The daughter is reluctant about talking. He's going to talk to her about it some more. Then he called me back. He said, you know, you can't talk to her. That's going to lead right back to me. Now, if you're in law enforcement um, and you go to court to testify, can you imagine what a defense lawyer would do to you if you saw, a, if you had gone on the record about a UFO? They would try to discredit them to a jury. They wouldn't be useful anymore in any type of investigation because they wouldn't be able to testify. Plus, it might, if they got any publicity, it probably would hinder them when they went to a scene you know, especially those kind of, you know, we have a, t a college there in our town, those rowdy college kids sometimes that get out of hand. It could make their jobs difficult. They could also find themselves drawing the uh, very worst shifts ever. So I totally understand why they don't want me to use their names, but at the same time, I keep hoping. Now, um, after I wrote the stories about Ricky, some people contacted me on the telephone and by email, and they told me um, they were concerned about Ricky, that he should have some help. I, they told me they were from Open Minds Forum. So uh, this sort of started a relationship with Open Minds Forum. Uh, they offered to bring him cameras or give him money to get cameras on the outside of his house. And I was so impressed with their compassion that I did go on that forum and, and say, hey, this is Angela Joyner, and I think y'all are doing great things for people that are in trouble. And um, I still uh, talk to some of those people. Well, they, they put together a little field investigation team to come out to Ricky's place, and it was on uh, April 4th through the 7th, and that stands for Open Minds Expeditionary Field Team. And they stayed three days, and... Um, Ricky invited him because he is so desperate for someone else to see what he's seen. He's seen it all together four times. Now, he's never had the up close and personal except the first time when it was 300 feet above his head. He could see it had no seams or rivets. It had some sort of cone-shaped indentions. It did not displace the air, 
it moved at a 45 degree angle like this when it took off. He said if he had blinked, he would have missed it, not like this. So um, he did have one friend with him on a sighting that was more uh, in the distance, but that friend won't go on the record. I've talked to him, and he said, I don't want, you know, what Ricky's been through to happen to me and my family. So it's kind of hard to argue with that. That's Ricky giving instructions to Steve Allen down there in that left-hand corner. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a county map, and he's making assignments for where everybody should go to Skywatch. I guess uh, there have been so many people interested in this story. Um, I had a, a man contact me, and uh, he... He, has, he sent for uh, FAA data. Uh, to, he received 2.5 million bits of raw data. He and uh, three other radar specialists are poring over that, as well as a scientist. Um, this is what they told me I could say. I said, I've got I to tell people about this at this conference. Um, they don't want their names used because they don't want to be inundated with questions and things and, um, and slow them down. Um, they said that the data was received from the Fort Worth FAA regional office through a Freedom of Information Act, and they thought the FAA was very helpful in providing the data. They think it's complete and it consists of information from about five different radar towers or sites. They say the radar analysis is in its early stage and will take several weeks due to the large amount of data that's in a raw format. So far, eight to ten jets have been confirmed in the Stephenville, Dublin area during the period of the sightings. They asked for the data on, for January the 8th from the hours of 4 to 8 p.m. Um, the man that's heading up the evaluations, I guess you would call them, um, is an expert in radar. He, uh, he's a, he was a radar specialist uh, with military radar experience from the White Sands Missile Range and a key investigator on TWA 800 radar returns. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. Um, I get emailed at least every other day. They're sending me updates, and a lot of it, I'm like, okay, put this in plain language. And, um, and they do. They're very patient with me. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what, what that comes up, what they come up with. Um, There we are. <laughs> um, this is the website that I write on now. Um, the first day it went up was February the 10th. Steve Allen already had something going on with a website, but when things kind of went sour for me at the newspaper, he said, look, Angela, you're going to have a place to write, and he stepped it up, and they've done a great job with this uh, website. And... Uh, I think these are three very courageous, unique men. We have formed a bond, a bond, and I think we will be in contact for the rest of our lives. Um, never, never thought that it would turn out this way. Never thought I would write a UFO story. I'll never forget Carol Chevalis with Channel 11 sitting across from my desk, and she said, um, Angela, how did you have the guts to do this story? I looked at the camera guy. She said, no, no, off the record. I said, well, you might have done it too. These people are so credible. And you can tell when they talk to you, when they start telling you what they saw, their voice changes. And if you had been the one to get the phone call or you had been the one to talk to them, you might, you might have done it. Um, I'd like to introduce this man in the black cowboy hat. That's my husband, Randall. He, th 
we, we just got married about two years ago, and he thought he was marrying a school teacher. <laughs> and then the school teacher became a newspaper reporter. And uh, I had another big story for our local area, and we had a county commissioner that had a bad road that was maiming people. <laughs> and, and I got it fixed. It just happened to be one of Randall's best friends was the commissioner. And uh, uh, he has been there with me through thick and thin. He supported me all the way. I don't think I would have been able to do it without him. There's somebody else here I want to recognize, and that's Mark Medford. Stand up, Mark. Mark Medford contacted me early on. He has designed and donated a beautiful art card for our website. He designed the really unique t-shirts that we have. And he did most of these PowerPoint slides uh, all the way from Maine. So this is the first time I got to meet him for the first time today. He's been a rock and an inspiration also. I can't believe all of the wonderful people I've met. And that's the good of UFO reporting. I mean, I have met so many interesting, intelligent, supportive people. And I've loved every minute of it. And I hope that I'm going to be doing this for a long time. Thank you.